When I was a kid, I read about creative people doing drugs or drinking till passing out on an endless loop. Somehow, it was made glamorous. Absinthe had a mystique. Somehow, supposedly, these chemicals allowed them to slay the dragon of entropy, create beauty, be anti-heroic. Somehow, the drug didn't include constipation, rotting teeth, or hepatitis. It didn't include prostitution to support a habit. It didn't include robbing elderly parents or scamming friends. The National Center for Health Statistics tells me this. Just before I was born, in 1950, there were 2.5 deaths per 100,000 Americans due to drug overdose. In 2017, there were 20.1 deaths per 100,000. Take a look at a graph. The line to stare at is the black one, the hockey stick shaped one. Almost any time you see a graph of a biological system with a slope that steep, something's wrong. The National Center for Health Statistics estimates there were 68,557 drug overdose deaths in 2018. An estimated 47,590 involved opioids and 31,897 involved synthetic opioids such as fentanyl or tramadol. So, any good news? Drug overdose deaths in the United States declined 5.1% in 2018, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Okay, given all that, who's pushing back against drug overdose and addiction? My guest today is Ian McLoon, lead therapist for the Altair Clinic in St. Paul. Ian's a licensed professional clinical counselor and a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for inviting me. So, Ian, if we're watching a baseball game, which position do we see you playing? Uh, definitely pitcher. Pitcher. Where I'm most comfortable. And where, uh, who are you playing for? Uh, St. Louis Park uh, High School varsity team. And what year is it? 2000. How do we get from you were once pitching well, doing well, and all, now the, there's more and more pain, um, and now the pain is getting to the point where you can't throw at all? Or I, yeah, talking yeah, to your exactly. coach? Yeah, so he knew that something was wrong. He knew that I was in trouble. We had just come from Florida for uh, our like spring training and had participated in a, a tournament with some of the best high school baseball teams in the country. And, uh, and I was feeling really confident. And then this first game of the season, I, he knew that something was wrong. I couldn't, I didn't have any control. I was walking batters. I got, uh, you know, probably gave up a couple of hits. And so I, he, he took me out and I sat on the bench and, and realized, okay, this is, this is serious. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go see a doctor and figure out what the heck is wrong with my shoulder. And what was the diagnosis? torn cartilage in my shoulder um, that required surgery and uh, and how did the surgery go um, the surgery went fine I put it off for um, for a little while and ended up um, coming home from Oregon after my sophomore year uh, at college and got the surgery done uh, over summer break so the surgery was successful in terms the of surgery the cartilage was successful, but it was also um, this kind of perfect moment where I got exposed to uh, high dose opioids at a time when I was uh, uh, really vulnerable and absolutely fell in love with that feeling. 
but then what happened? Yeah, I was kind of, I, I never really grieved the loss of my baseball dreams. Um, the, the, my, my experience of the opioids, it filled a need internally that was really salient and really powerfully pleasurable. And in such a way that um, I knew I wanted to keep using them. I had um, what I now understand to be uh, kind of a, um, a, a quintessential experience of the person who eventually develops addiction to opioids. I had um, a moment where I felt like the clouds had parted and angels were singing down from the heavens and I was home. I was literally in my dad's basement at home and figuratively at home with this feeling that I had never imagined was possible. And that was what inspired me to keep chasing it. So what happened, so at a certain point, the effect is going to sure. wear off and here was euphoria. Yeah. And what happens when the effect wears off? Well, then I start to become um, interested in finding more. It wasn't difficult for me to find uh, uh, supplies of other opioids, uh, you know, maybe Percocet, um, Vicodin, or, and then eventually more concentrated forms like morphine, Dilaudid, Oxycodone, Oxycontin. All your time in the hospital and um, outpatient, was there any discussion, was there a handout, a video that you were given to watch about the potential dangers of, of medication? No, not at all. At, at most, it was implied by some of the pre prescribers. So uh, when I came back to school, I approached one of the student health clinics doctors, and he agreed to write me one prescription, but said after that, you know, uh, I'm not going to write you anymore. And my interaction with him was on the very, very front end of this story so mm -hmm. um i uh you know again i think that he underestimated my risk in retrospect um during all this time are you having any internal conversations with yourself this has got to stop this is not good for me um i don't think i really had that significant of a negative experience until I experienced uh, withdrawal for the first time. Um, I remember I didn't really have any pills and I was at home um, one evening trying to sleep and I couldn't fall asleep. It was like I had um, not quite to the extent of having bugs crawling on my skin, but I had just an inner restlessness mm -hmm. that was really uncomfortable. And I realized, holy crap, this, this is withdrawal. And that was kind of my first inkling that like, this is not great, but it wasn't, wasn't enough for me to reach out or talk about it with anyone. And the second half of my senior year at college was when things like especially ramped up. Uh, and you have, and was it a question? I mean, I often hear that this, this, uh, 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 oh God, this fiendish economic uh, situation where it is less expensive to buy heroin than say prescription drugs, which are manufactured to a high standard. So was that the attraction for the heroin? It wasn't so much the physical effect. It was it more economic or... Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, I think if I had, if I were able to choose at the time, again, I was looking for Oxycontin. It was consistent and I knew how to dose it. I knew how much I needed. Um, heroin was kind of an unknown 
for me at the time. But then once I made the switch, it became absolutely an economic decision where heroin is just far cheaper and uh, at the time was more plentiful. And so it was, and still is certainly. And so uh, that was a big um, factor. But yeah, the, but part of the impetus for moving home was that in order to feed my drug habit, I resorted to selling um, uh, illicit substances and got caught doing so. And so there was really nothing for me in Oregon. So I moved back to Minnesota, but again, things just continued to spiral so from there. Um, when I did get caught with heroin in Minnesota a few years later, I went to jail and thankfully Hennepin County is was at the time one of very few uh, county jail systems in the US where they would still provide um, uh, a dose, of, I guess three doses of methadone, which I was on when I got arrested. And so I was able to um, stave off the worst of withdrawals while in jail. Um, however, it was a harrowing and scary experience. What are your next steps in dealing yeah, with that? Yeah, so by that point, um, my wife and I had had our first child and I kept telling myself and telling the people around me, you know, today, tomorrow's the day. I'll quit tomorrow. I know I need to do this. I'll quit tomorrow. And then tomorrow just never came. And then I got arrested. And then it was like, okay, for sure tomorrow I'll quit. Uh, for sure tomorrow. And I just never quite did it. And it was actually um, a decision where my wife was at the end of her rope. My father was tired of me just kind of running to his house every time I got uh, asked to not come home because I had been caught using. And so the two of them agreed that I was not welcome at either house unless I agreed to get treatment. And so that was kind of the, the moment where I decided, okay, I know I need to do this. I don't know what the heck it's gonna look like, but I'm gonna um, go through the public system here in Minnesota and, and, and look for help and, and go to rehab. And um, what kind of help did you get? What kind of rehab yeah. did you do? So I didn't really know anything about addiction treatment, the science of addiction, um, what are the resources available in the Twin Cities or the state or beyond? And so I was really dependent upon the opinion and recommendation of the assessor. Uh, so I agreed to go to the place that was closest to my home, um, right on the edge of downtown Minneapolis, where at least ostensibly my family could come and visit me on the weekends. Um, and so of course I opted for that one. It sounded super reasonable. Little did I know that this was a treatment program based on one of the most outdated, confrontational, and in my opinion, toxic uh, forms of treatment uh, that I thought would be a uh, now standing here today i would imagine that this would be a relic of the 70s but it turns out we have uh, a bustling program here in the in minneapolis i had um kind of one very um, meaningful experience there and so uh, that helps to illustrate this point. So um, by the time um, it was, I was in my you know third month there, 
I had become a, a senior peer where I was given additional responsibilities and privileges to help the other guys in the program. And part of that was acting as a chaperone on um, other clients' weekend passes. One uh, Saturday, I was hey, I was a chaperone, and you know we went um, to my to uh, another resident's house and hung out with his family. And it's like six thirty, and he goes to ask his dad for a ride. And his dad says, I'm not driving. I'm not taking you anywhere. He had already started drinking. And so we were kind of um, stuck. And we ended up um, hopping on a bus and taking the uh, public transit back to the office. Well, we ended up getting home probably about an hour late, uh, hour later than, than we were supposed to be there. And we explained the situation and told him what was going on. I kind of thought that was it. The next day was my son's first birthday party, right? and it was my turn for a pass. And so I went home and we had a, a really nice birthday party. We you know, sang happy birthday, did cake and candles and presents. Um, and then all of a sudden, my wife gets a phone call and she says, Hi, Ian, uh, it's for you. And it's um, one of the staff at the rehab and he says ian you got to come home right now i'm like why what happened it's my son's birthday you know what what's going on i don't know man but you got to come home right this second so i excused myself and uh, must have gotten a ride back to the program and was told that i needed to sit on the bench and the bench was a literal bench out in the hallway outside of all the group rooms. And so I was on the bench for three straight days. And when you're on the bench, you can't talk to any of the other residents. You can't watch TV or use the phone. You can't even join the groups. You are an outcast for as long as you are on the bench. And I, I just remember sitting there thinking, this does not feel right to me. This this can't be a medically approved, scientifically informed treatment. There's no way that this is effective. And kind of that moment planted the seed that would help inform um, what I would decide to do with my career. Uh, and that is essentially to try and provide uh, an alternative to the traditional model of addiction treatment. And then I assume that you went through your education, you obtained yeah. your, your credentials. Um, yep. At what point did you, um, uh, so the, the founder of Altier Clinic is Dr. Mark Willenbring. When did you get connected with him? And I found this great program at the University of Minnesota, which at the time was a certificate program, but it was at a graduate level because I'd already had my bachelor's degree. And um, right around the time that I got accepted into that program, I just, I had been kind of reading different um, websites that covered addiction and treatment and news and science. And I just so happened to read this interview um, by this addiction psychiatrist who was saying all this kind of revolutionary stuff that seemed silly for being revolutionary. It seemed really spot on and made a lot of sense and resonated with me, but it was um, a pretty radical view, it turns out. Um, and so I'm like, I'm reading the article and he says something I'm like, yeah, oh, cool. And I'm re keep reading the article. I'm like, oh, this guy's amazing. Oh, okay. This is super cool. And then I see at the very bottom, there's a link to his clinic and it just so happens he's here in St. Paul. So I reached out, I introduced myself and said, Hey, I, you know, I really like what you're doing. I think it's really amazing. I would love the opportunity to train with you or to learn from you? Would you be willing to have lunch sometime? And he very graciously said yes. And from that point on, I just kind of followed him around <laughs> wherever he went and 
tried to learn from him. And um, not only was he my supervisor throughout my training, um, but then over time we co-developed this new model of treatment called the Altier approach. Now, um, where are you at personally as far as drugs and things like that? Um, on, I actually just celebrated 10 years heroin free on October the 4th. So that was 2010. So from that point on, uh, I stopped using and uh, haven't had any recurrences uh, since that time. I'm, I'm guessing that if I walk into the waiting room of the Altier Clinic, there's not a bench there. No, no, so most definitely not. Tell me, tell me more about the approach that the clinic yeah, uses. So, so we, uh, like I said, we, we are set up as an alternative to the traditional rehab model. Um, so addiction exists on a continuum from mild to moderate to severe. And uh, some, and in fact, the majority of people who have a substance use disorder, at least two thirds, if not more, fall on the mild to moderate end of the spectrum. Uh, and, and in part, our approach is much less intensive than a traditional model. And so we work with people on a low intensity framework but we work with them for a long period of time. We develop an initial treatment plan and initial recommendations based on um, their specific situation and symptoms, any coexisting concerns that they have like depression, anxiety, insomnia, ADHD. And then we use the latest research and um, uh, medical advancements to offer a, a set of tools that might assist somebody in uh, achieving their goals, whether those goals are reduced consumption or total abstinence. Uh, and then we make the commitment to each patient that we will stick with you until you have achieved your goals. And for some people that's six weeks, for other people that's you know five or six years, it just really depends on the person. What's the first thing I'm gonna notice that's different between what you're saying to me versus what I heard in traditional treatment? So first of all, you would hear a lot about um, individual risk factors that you have uh, that have uh, predisposed you to the development of problematic substance use. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, the neuroscience of addiction and the genetic underpinnings uh, of addiction. And then a lot of the different treatment interventions that we have are targeted at specific um, mechanisms within the neurobiology of addiction. Uh, and that piece of education, our patients love right? It's, uh, it's, it's extremely helpful. And it helps to set the stage for what is for most people a process of behavior change that requires multiple quit attempts, sustained effort over time, and uh, the ability to kind of pick yourself up after you fall down, dust yourself off, and get back at it, as opposed to being shamed and blamed for the having those setbacks in the first place. What does that give people that they don't get in other treatment programs? Uh, insight, uh, an explanation and a framework for understanding how they find themselves in this situation. Without that, um, it's hard to, to model an effective treatment approach to, to instill hope in somebody that what they're experiencing isn't um, a core failure of their character or morals or um, personality, but is instead uh, uh, a complex interaction between their genetic um, uh, 
between their genetics and how they were born into this world and their unique environmental factors that might have triggered or uh, uh, contributed additional risk factors to them over the course of their lifespan. What can you give me in a sense of, of metrics? How, how successful is your program? We have done some um, internal uh, study and found that um, among a random sample of 100 patients who were being treated for alcohol use disorder and had been at the clinic for a year, that 80% of them had said that they were at their at or near their drinking goal that they had started out with. And so um, that that's about the you know the best metric that I could give you. And yet I would also um, preface that or add a caveat to that to say that our field, our industry does not place a huge emphasis on outcomes research and outcomes studies. And so we did that on our own. There's no external body that requires that or expects that, which is a huge problem uh, in our field because we could never look at that and be providing terrible care, but there would be no mechanism by which to, to judge that. Um... What's, is there any one thing that you could suggest to a person who sees somebody suffering to help them move in the direction of treatment? Understand and empathize that that person who is struggling with addiction is already experiencing quite a lot of distress, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. Almost everybody, by the time they actually reach out for help, mm -hmm. has been struggling for months and months, if not years, knows that they need to make a change, but isn't sure how to do it, or they don't have the confidence that they can make an effective change. And so the idea that people are just like walking around in denial and just kind of being jerks about their substance use is, is, is highly flawed and highly stigmatized. And if somebody having listened to you um, feels that Altair might be a good move for them, how can they get in touch with you folks? They can just call our front desk, 651-348-7611, and uh, let us know that you're looking for help, and we can, we can absolutely get an initial intake uh, scheduled if it seems that that's appropriate. Well, Ian, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Cal. Really happy to be here. I've been talking with Ian McLoon, lead therapist at Altier Clinic in St. Paul. A wise matriarch told me that the most common mistake people make is thinking of addicts as hedonists, people who live for pleasure. Wrong. The pleasures, the absence of craving for too short a moment. Bookending that pleasure is trying to survive, trying to regain control. You can post comments, questions, suggest topics or guests for future shows on the Affirming Flame Facebook page. That's the Affirming Flame. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that if you know someone who's struggling with opioids, you'll guide them to some help. I'm Cal Heil.